The first time I read the probable cause affidavit for Rick Allen was during my live chat on November 29th, the day it came out. And I wasn't really able to grasp all of it during that live chat, so I've been rereading it over and over. So this video will be me sharing my thoughts, some photos I created, and an extremely detailed timeline I created after trying to make sense of the witness times referenced in the PCA. Just to be clear, this video is a deep dive. So if you're looking for a general overview, this is not a good video for you to waste your time on. However, if there is one section to watch, I would suggest my timeline deep dive if you are not familiar with all those facts. These are the 16 topics that I tried to organize my research into. Charges against Rick, key facts in the PCA, probable cause affidavit, overview of trail area, overview of witnesses, timeline deep dive, is Rick in Libby's photos, the CPS building, and is there more than one vehicle there, why police looked at Rick again in 2022, the defense team press release, what's next in Rick's case, Ron Logan, was Rick the ski mask guy, and does he have any connection to the Kleins, my questions for Rick, the stock ticker, reasons for and against Rick as the kidnapper, and finally, my verdict. So if you like going into details and deep dives, maybe you'll find this video helpful. I want to start with what Rick Allen is charged with. In Indiana, it says Title 3542 1-1, and then in parentheses, it's 2. So Title 35 is Criminal Law and Procedure. Article 42 is Offenses Against the Person. Chapter 1 is Homicide. So 35-42-1-1 is Murder. Section 1 says a person who, and then number 2 says, kills another human being while committing or attempting to commit, and then it lists a bunch of different felonies, and here it says kidnapping. So Rick is being charged as a person who kills another human being while committing or attempting to commit kidnapping, commits murder a felony. The prosecutor needs to get all 12 members of the jury to get a unanimous decision where they all believe that Rick was the man who told Abby and Libby to go down the hill, which led to them being murdered. The prosecutor does not have to prove that Rick was the one who stabbed them or did anything after making them move from the bridge to down the hill. Next up are some key facts from the probable cause affidavit, which I will refer to as the PCA. I'm going to read some of the main facts before I analyze it. So if you've already read this and you're familiar with it, you can skip this part. Before I start, I have to say, this is poorly written and organized, and I hope that the prosecution's preparation for trial is more professional. When I read this live for the first time on my November 29th live chat, I noticed that this should have said 2017. Prosecutor Nick McClelland is the one who signed this, and he needs to proofread these documents before he submits them and makes them public. It's not a good look that nobody caught this error. The formatting of this document is kind of hard to read, so I created PowerPoint slides for some of this information. This is what police knew in 2017. Investigators reviewing prior tips encountered a tip narrative from an officer who interviewed Richard M. Allen in 2017. That narrative stated, Mr. Allen was on the trail between 1.30 and 3.30. He parked at the old Farm Bureau building and walked to the new Freedom Bridge. While at the Freedom Bridge, he saw three females. He noted one was taller and had brown or black hair. He did not remember description, nor did he speak with them. He walked from the Freedom Bridge to the High Bridge. He did not see anybody, although he stated he was watching a stock ticker on his phone as he walked. He stated there were vehicles parked at the High Bridge trailhead, however, did not pay attention to them. He did not take any photos or video. Below that, they list his cell phone information, potential follow-up information, who were the three girls walking in the area of Freedom Bridge? How about following up on who was this guy who was at the bridge during the time of the murders? This was a massive mistake by law enforcement to not have followed up on this guy. If I was a member of the families, I would be so livid that this should have been solved within a few days instead of five and a half years. Anyway, moving along. This 2017 interview makes no mention of him stepping onto High Bridge and looking at fish. It just says he walked to the bridge. This paragraph makes it sound like he talked to the officer for five minutes at the grocery store and then the guy was like, okay, thanks, bye. Rick was interviewed again on October 13th, 2022, when police searched his home. The summary is, he saw juvenile girls on the trails east of Freedom Bridge, so on the trails, not the Freedom Bridge area, then went out onto Monon High Bridge first platform to watch the fish. 
Then he went back and sat on a bench on the trail and left. He stated he parked his car on the side of an old building. He was wearing blue jeans and a blue or black Carhartt jacket with a hood. He advised he may have been wearing some type of head covering as well. He saw no one else except for the juvenile girls east of Freedom Bridge. He owns firearms and they are at his home. Some people said you can see large fish from the bridge if the creek is calm, so it is not unheard of. But the creek seemed higher on February 14th since it snowed on February 9th and then melted around February 11th. So the water current may have been flowing harder than normal, making it hard to see any fishies. <laughs> In the helicopter footage from February 14th, the water does not look very clear. Also, Platform 1 is located above dirt, so nice try, Rick. However, in this photo from Platform 1, you can see the rocks in the clear water, but why would he not have gone further out on the bridge to get a better view of the fish? Rick's wife spoke to investigators, and she confirmed he did have guns and knives at the residence. She stated he still owns a blue Carhartt jacket. I'll talk more about the jacket later. On October 13th of this year, investigators executed a search warrant of Rick's house. Among the items taken, officers located jackets, boots, knives and firearms, including a Sig Sauer Model P226 40 caliber pistol with this serial number, which Rick bought in 2001. Between October 14th and 19th, the Indiana State Police Laboratory performed analysis on Rick's gun. They did a physical examination and classification of the firearm, function test, barrel and overall length measurement, test firing, ammunition component characterization, microscopic comparison, and NIBIN, which stands for the National Integrated Ballistic Information Network. NIBIN embodies the collaboration of law enforcement for the sole purpose of identifying and prosecuting shooters that prey upon our communities. The lab determined the unspent round located within two feet of Libby's body had been cycled through Rick's Sig Sauer model P226. The lab remarked, an identification opinion is reached when the evidence exhibits an agreement of class characteristics and a sufficient agreement of individual marks. Sufficient agreement is related to the significant duplication of random striated slash impressed marks as evidenced by the correspondence of a pattern or combination of patterns of surface contours. The interpretation of identification is subject in nature and based on relevant scientific research and the reporting examiner's training and experience. There was speculation that Rick was arrested at his job at CVS or at his home, but it sounds to me like he went to the Indiana State Police and answered some questions, and then they kept him there and arrested him. So on October 26th, Rick voluntarily went to the ISP post and said he never let anyone use or borrow his gun. He did not have an explanation how a bullet matching his gun could have been found in between Abby and Libby. He denied knowing Abby and Libby and any involvement in their murders. Rick stated he had not been on the property where the unspent round was found, that he did not know Ron Logan, who was the property owner, and that he had no explanation as to why a round cycled through his firearm would be at that location. Police believe Rick is the man on video who forced the girls down the hill, which resulted in them being murdered. The three juvenile females were on the trails from at least when they took a photo of Monon High Bridge at 1243 to before 146 when they crossed the overpass, and they only observed one other person on the trails, an adult male. Witness 4 was on the trails from 146 to 214, and she only saw one adult male. All four females described the male in similar manners, quote, leading investigators to believe all four saw the same male individual. Investigators identified other individuals on the trails or County Road 300 North between 2.30 and 4.11 p.m. None of those individuals saw a male subject matching the description of Richard Allen on the trail. Richard stated he only saw three girls on the trail. Investigators believe that after the victims were murdered, Richard Allen returned to his vehicle by walking down County Road 300 North. The PCA listed the cars Rick owned at the time of the murders, one was a 2016 black Ford Focus, which he drove, and the other was a 2006 gray Ford 500, which I guess his wife drove. Near the end of the video, a male is seen and heard telling the girls, guys, down the hill. Although I think he says, go down the hill. Down the hill. Down the hill. Down the hill. 
I thought it was interesting that they said near the end of the video, a male is seen and heard. What did they mean seen? Is it just his jeans, his waist, his feet? Like what part of his body is shown? Obviously he was seen at the beginning of the video, but by the time he reached them, it was the end of the 43 second video. So I'd be interested to know exactly what part of him was seen and if that could be matched up to Rick. Clothes were found in the Deer Creek belonging to both Abby and Libby, south of where their bodies were located. So did these come off in a struggle in the water? Did Rick throw them into the creek after the murders? Did he go down to the creek to wash off after the murders and try to wash his DNA off of their clothing? Also, why did Ron Logan's document say, quote, the blank of one of the victims was missing from the crime scene while the rest of their clothing was recovered, end quote. Did this mean that the clothes of both girls were found in the creek, but there were some other item or items that were completely missing and assumed to be taken by the killer? It seems to be since the next sentence in that document mentioned how killers take souvenirs from crime scenes. I felt like a key part of figuring out if Rick could be the guy on the bridge and the only guy on the bridge was to figure out an average time it takes to get from these different parts on the trail and the bridge. This is going to be confusing with my map and calculations, but I think this is important in determining if Rick can be the bridge guy and therefore guilty of the kidnapping that led to murder. I watched a few videos with people walking the trail and the bridge, and obviously different people walk different paces, so there were some variations in times, but here are the times that I've determined. I also tried to color code this. I know some people are like, oh my gosh, you're so OCD, Tom. So this image is from Google Earth, and up here it says April 2017. So the first thing I'm going to show is number one, is how long it takes to walk from CPS to the first bench on the trail. I wrote approximately five minutes. Here I have number one, which is at the CPS building where Rick parked. So we would have had to come through Freedom Bridge area, and then the trail starts, and then around in this area is where there's the first bench. From what I saw, there are five total benches on the Monon High Bridge Trail. For people who do not know, Mears is the last name of the family who owns this property and farm on the north side of 300. There's a little area where people park, so people call it the Mears Lot, or the Mears Trail Intersection or Trail Head. So between the start of the trail and the Mears Intersection, I counted four total benches. There is a fifth bench here. I did not see any benches between Mears and the bridge. This will become important later because Rick said he sat on a bench and didn't see nobody. <laughs> so number two, I did from CPS to the Mears intersection and it's approximately nine minutes and 30 seconds. So two, you go here to here is two, is nine minutes and 30 seconds. Number three is from the CPS building to the first piece of wood on the bridge, which takes approximately 14 minutes and 30 seconds. I think the fastest somebody could do this is in about 10 minutes, walking very fast, or slowly it could take 20 minutes. So here is three, it's the blue one. You come all the way here to the start of the bridge. Approximately 14 minutes and 30 seconds to 15 minutes. Number four is the start of the trail after Freedom Bridge to the Mears intersection, which is in orange. You can see the number four and then it stops here. So this takes approximately six minutes and 30 seconds one way, which is 13 minutes round trip. I will discuss this more in a few minutes when I talk about witness four. I did see one person took about 8 minutes and another took 11 minutes, but the video I saw of somebody who did it in 6 minutes and 30 seconds seemed to be a normal pace. Number 5 is the Mears intersection to Monon High Bridge, which is 5 minutes. I have the purple 5 here and it stops here. I tried to watch a lot of these trail walking videos so I could get accurate times, but everybody was holding their cell phone cameras in their hand as they walked and it was making me nauseous, so I felt like I was going to hurl, so I had to stop watching them. <laughs> The fastest I saw somebody go from the Mears intersection to the start of the bridge was about 4 minutes and 30 seconds. The slowest was over 6 minutes, but I think 5 minutes is a decent average. This pink number 6 is halfway between the Mears intersection to Monon High Bridge. It takes about 2 minutes and 30 seconds here, 2 minutes and 30 seconds here. This halfway point is where Witness 4 passed Abby and Libby. Number 7 is Monon High Bridge first piece of wood to down the hill. It takes about 5 minutes and 30 seconds going slow. Walking very fast can get there a little bit under four minutes. The yellow number eight is from down the hill to the approximate murder site. It takes about four to five minutes crossing the creek and going through the woods. To the left of number eight, you can kind of see this building, which is a business called Hoosier Harvest Store. They had a video camera which captured a lot of these cars going by. The driving time between Mears Lot and Hoosier Harvest Store is 20 seconds. From Hoosier Harvest Store all the way to CPS is 60 seconds.
So I created a spreadsheet <laughs> for all my spreadsheet lovers out there just to make it easier to keep track of everybody on the trails that afternoon, which I don't know why the police probably did not do this, but <sighs> I don't even know what to say. <laughs> when you're trying to grasp a lot of information, spreadsheets are a good way to organize it so you can see it all together. The witness numbering system in column A are what I assign to them in chronological order, not law enforcement. In this section, I'm going to review the different witnesses, what they said in common, what they said that did not match up, when they saw Rick, what was he wearing, what was he doing, and a bunch of other information. Rick admitted that he passed these three juvenile girls, so even though their descriptions of him are noticeably different, it does not mean that it was not him. They did pass Rick as he walked to the bridge around 1.30. I've tried doing like an eyewitness test where I barely pay attention to somebody as I pass them, usually a family member, and then I try to describe their face and clothing and it's not easy. So I know it's frustrating and kind of suspicious reading some of these like how are they coming up with all these different things when they saw the same person, the same car, but just to be clear, these three girls walked past Rick. He said he walked past them. Rick said he parked at CPS between this time, so it was his car at CPS. I'll get into that in a second. Grab a snack and a drink. We'll be here for a long time. <laughs> I need a snack and a drink. So this part of the PCA says interviews were conducted with three juveniles, comma, blank and blank, period. I know that they redacted some names, especially since these girls were juveniles and they don't want people bothering them. But if it was three girls, why would they have blank and blank? I don't know if the unredacted says interviews were conducted with three juveniles, two men and two women. It's not important, so I'm not going to continue trying to decode it. So these three girls were off from school that day. They went down to the Monon High Bridge and took a photo. And then they walked back to Freedom Bridge. One girl took a photo of a bench near Freedom Bridge, and the timestamp was 126. And they said soon after that, they encountered Rick. In this spreadsheet, the cells that are highlighted black do not have any information, so I just blacked them out. There's no information that's redacted. It's just me trying to make it easier to read, although it looks kind of whack. <laughs> it looks like I was playing Tetris. All right, Tom, keep it moving. So the different columns I came up with are name, description, age, height, weight, hair color, eye color, pants, shoes, shirts, jacket, head, glasses, time arrived, time left, who did they see, and why were they on the trail? So row two has bridge guy video. For height, I wrote that they need to perform a video analysis with people five foot two to six foot four to narrow down the height of bridge guy and see if it matches Rick at around five foot seven. He looks like he's of average weight in the video. His pants are light colored jeans. His shoes are kind of hard to see, like a lot of things. They look brown or black, but they do not look like sneakers, possibly some kind of boots. We're not sure what he's wearing under his jacket, possibly a brown hoodie or sweatshirt. His jacket was a dark blue. On his head, we're not sure if he has a hood, a hat, or a combination. The color changes between army green or brown. According to a witness who was driving on 300 North around 3.57 p.m., they saw somebody muddy and bloody matching the description of Bridge Guy. Why was he on the trail that day? We just don't know at this point. Was it kidnapping, assault, murder? So for row three, I have a description of Rick Allen. He was 44 at the time of the murders. His current mugshot lists him as 5'7", 180 pounds. His hair color is gray, brown. I wrote dirty, but that, that doesn't sound very nice, but... His eye color seems to change in different photos, so sometimes it looks blue, sometimes it appears darker. He was wearing jeans that day. For his jacket, he stated he was wearing a blue or black Carhartt jacket with a hood. On his head, he probably had a hood. Time arrived, he said 1.30, and the Hoosier Harvester camera captured him on 1.27, so that was somewhat accurate. He said he left at 3.30. Who did he see? He said the entire time during these two hours, he only saw the three young girls near Freedom Bridge. Why was he on the trail? It's unknown at this point, but he said he went to the bridge to look at fish down below in the creek, and the bridge is 63 feet above the water. Now I'm going to review these three young witnesses who saw him. So for height, witness two said he was not very tall, not bigger than five foot ten. Witness three said her head came approximately to his shoulder. Only witness two described his weight and said he had a bigger build, only witness one described his hair and said gray, maybe a little brown. For pants, witness one said he was wearing blue jeans. Witness two said he was in all black. And witness three said baggy black jeans.
For shoes, possibly witness two said he was wearing black shoes. Witness three said he was wearing black boots. For shirt, only witness three said it was black. Witness one said, really light blue jacket, a duck canvas type. I don't know if really light means light in weight or light in blue color. Witness two said all black. Witness three said blue or black windbreaker. Witness three also said he had a black hoodie on his head. Describing the man they passed on the trail, witness one said, kind of creepy. He did not really show his face. Witness two said she said hi to Rick, but he just glared at them. He had something covering his mouth. Witness three said he was walking with purpose, like he knew where he was going, with his hands in his pockets and kept his head down. After these three girls encountered Rick, they continued walking across Freedom Bridge and the old railroad bridge over Old State Road 25. So how can there be this discrepancy between these girls describing Rick's clothing as being blue or black? Some people are wondering, well, was there another guy who was wearing black and different clothes than Rick? And the answer is no. Rick said he passed these three girls. This is a screen capture from a walking video. And you can see here on the right is a bench, which is the first bench near Freedom Bridge, which possibly is the area where these girls walked past Rick. And you can see the trees create a shadow here. So if you're not really paying attention to somebody, it could look like Rick was wearing a darker color black if they encountered him in the shade. If you look at the video of Bridge Guy, the right side of his jacket when it's in the shade looks very dark, so they could have just confused it with black. So why was Rick not polite and replied hello to the girl who said hi to him near Freedom Bridge? I can understand a man not initiating a hello to a young group of girls, but to not reply back to them at all is kind of suspicious. Witness 4 was captured on the Hoosier Harvestor camera at 1.46 p.m. to park at the Mears lot. A few minutes before she got there, she said she saw four juvenile females walking on the bridge over Old State Road 25 as she drove underneath on her way to park. In the bottom right of the screen is where the first bench is and possibly where they passed Rick. So the girls walked here and they crossed Freedom Bridge. And this second overpass, which I highlighted in yellow, is where they are walking where Witness 4 was driving by. And she thought she saw four juvenile girls walking across here, but it was three. Witness 4 said there were no cars at Mears lot when she parked. She got out of her car and walked to Monon High Bridge and saw a male matching the one from Libby's video. She described him as a white male wearing blue jeans and a blue jean jacket. He was standing on platform one of Monon High Bridge approximately 50 feet from her. They described platform one as 50 feet out, but as you can see, it's not that far from the start of the bridge. Just to make clear, Rick did admit that he was standing on platform one of the Monon High Bridge. So after she saw Rick, she turned around and continued walking back in the other direction. And about halfway between the Monon High Bridge and the Mears intersection, she passed Abby and Libby as they were walking to the bridge. It takes approximately two and a half minutes from the Monon High Bridge to the halfway point to Mears intersection. In the 30 minutes Witness 4 was on the trail, she saw no other adults other than the male on the bridge. So she only saw Rick during the 30 minutes she was on the trail. Her car was captured on the Hoosier Harvestor camera, leaving at 2.14. A minute later, she saw a car parked in an odd manner at the CPS building because it was, quote, backed in near the building. Again, this was Rick's car that he admitted to parking at that time. So it turns out I was wrong in my first Delphi deep dive video when I assumed that the killer was possibly waiting at the Mears intersection bench since it seems like a good area to evaluate where everybody is on the trail. So Rick was the only man near the bridge from 1.50 until 2.13, unless some man came from the south end of the bridge, which is private property, and not easily accessed. But Rick said he did not see any men on the trail or the bridge. Rick said he only saw the three juvenile girls the entire two hours he was out there. So did he actually see Witness 4 look at him on Monon High Bridge? It's very close, and it seems unlikely that he did not see her because she described him as white, so his back was probably not turned. Also, the trail has dirt and rocks, so he probably would have heard her steps, so I don't know why he said he only saw three girls. Witness 5 was a male driver who described the car he saw at the CPS building. This was around 2.10 p.m., three minutes before Libby's video. He said that he saw a purple PT Cruiser or small SUV parked at CPS, and it seemed like it was backed in to conceal the license plate. 
The state of Indiana only requires a license plate on the back of a car, not on the front. Both Witness 5 and 4 drew diagrams of how and where the car was parked and they both matched up. Witness 6 was another male driver. He was captured on Hoosier Harvest Store at 2.28 p.m. And he said he saw a smaller, dark-colored car at CPS, possibly a smart car. Like the various descriptions of Rick by the three juveniles, obviously it's kind of frustrating that these people are giving these different descriptions of the car that was parked there. But Rick did admit that his 2016 Ford Focus was parked there between 1.30 and 3.30. He also said he passed the three girls. He also admitted he was on the bridge near the time of the murder. So there are no other men who were spotted. And Rick said he saw no men. So there was not another car at CPS. It was Rick's car. Witness 7 was a female driver whose car was captured on the Hoosier Harvest Store camera at 3.57 p.m. She said she spotted a man walking on the north side, which is the Mears Farm side, of 300 North, walking west toward the CPS building where Rick was parked, as she drove east. The man was wearing blue jeans and a blue jacket, and she described him as muddy and bloody. It appeared like he had gotten into a fight. So this is 300 that goes back to CPS, and it's unknown exactly where she saw him. But this is Hoosier Harvest Store here, and she was traveling east, so it had to be somewhere along here. And the bodies were found in this area here. Rick likely could have seen or heard the people on or near the bridge after the murders, so he could not walk the trails or the woods back to CPS. 3.57 p.m. was about 45 minutes after Libby's dad arrived, and he was walking the trails, as were Flannel Shirt Guy, the female bridge photographer and her friend, arguing couple, and possibly more people. It had been about one hour and 45 minutes since the man, assumed to be Rick, crossed the creek with the girls, possibly up to his waist. So regarding this woman describing Rick's jeans and his clothes as being muddy and bloody, would the cold water have dried from his jeans in one hour and 45 minutes? Whether it was mud or blood on his jeans may not matter, but the woman did notice that his jeans had coloring that was out of the ordinary, and he was walking in the direction of where Rick parked his car. And this road is fairly remote, so to see a man walking instead of driving on it is kind of suspicious. The PCA said there were other people on the trail after 2.13, which was the time of Libby's video, and none of them saw anyone resembling the man from Libby's video. Rick did resemble the man on Libby's video. Under the yellow line, I included a few people that have been rumored about over the past few years. They were not mentioned in the PCA, but I just want to review them real quick. So Witness 8 and her friend were females. Witness 8 took two photos of the bridge, and this one was timestamped at 349 after she made it to the end of the bridge and turned around and was on her way back. So this was posted to Snapchat eight minutes before the woman driving saw a guy muddy and bloody on the road. This woman said online that she did see arguing couple, but she did not see anybody resembling the guy in Libby's video. Witness 9, I believe, was in his early 20s at the time, and it's been rumored that he was at the trails with a girl other than his girlfriend, and they may have had an argument down by the bridge. There had been speculation that the male of the arguing couple possibly gave a witness description for the sketch, but he later said that the guy he saw was Flannel Shirt Guy, not Bridge Guy. And lastly, Witness 10 is known as Flannel Shirt Guy. His family and brother have been very active in restoring the trails for a long time. It's rumored that he saw Libby's father and also arguing couple. Next up is a very detailed timeline I created, trying to figure out all this stuff to see if Rick could possibly be the bridge guy. Some of these times are verified and some are approximate, but even if they're off by about two to three minutes, I don't think it changes anything. I created four columns. The first one is time, which is in chronological order. Column B says verified or approximate. Verified means it was either captured on camera or approximate, which is not verified. Column C will be the event I'm talking about, and column D will have any additional notes or questions. I will highlight in yellow whichever row I'm talking about. So we start at 1243. It's verified because the teenage girl took a photo at Monon High Bridge with her two friends. 126 is verified because the same teenage girl took a photo of a trail bench east of Freedom Bridge. It's unclear which of the benches this was. As they walked toward Freedom Bridge, they encountered Rick, And to be clear, this is certain. It was not another guy, a bridge guy, or anything. Rick confirmed he passed these three girls at that spot. 127 is verified. Rick's Ford Focus was captured on the Hoosier Harvest Store camera headed to the CPS lot. The time it takes from Hoosier Harvest Store to CPS is exactly 60 seconds, and it takes 20 seconds from Hoosier Harvest Store to the Mears lot. 
So around 129, Rick parked his black Ford Focus at CPS. It's possibly a hatchback model, which I'll talk about later. I came up with this time since it's one minute after Hoosier Harvest Store, plus about one minute to back his car into the spot. Was he putting things in his jacket in the car that delayed his exit from the car? According to my calculations, approximately 136 is the latest Rick could have gotten out of his car CPS and made it to Platform 1 on Monon High Bridge to be seen at the time Witness 4 arrived at Monon High Bridge. At approximately 141, this would be the latest Rick could have passed the three girls at the bench near the start of the trail. This was based on the timing of Witness 4 who saw him on Platform 1. 146 is verified because Hoosier Harvest Store's camera captured Witness 4's car headed to the Mears lot 20 seconds away. She parked in the empty Mears lot and likely walked soon after. At approximately 148, Witness 4 made a left at the trail intersection going towards Monon High Bridge. It takes approximately 5 minutes from Mears intersection to the Monon High Bridge walking a normal pace. 149 is verified because Libby's sister Kelsey's car was captured on Hoosier Harvest Store camera after dropping Abby and Libby off at the Mears lot. Kelsey told Libby to put on a sweatshirt, so Libby may have stopped to put her sweatshirt on and looked at her phone while walking, which would have slowed down their entire walk to Monon High Bridge. 1.51 is the approximate time I came up with when Abby and Libby would have reached the Mears intersection. They may have hung out there for a minute before making a left to the Monon High Bridge and walked slowly, like I said, if she was looking at her phone. 1.53 is also approximate. So if Witness 4 turned on the trail at 1.48 and it takes 5 minutes to Monon High Bridge, she saw Rick on Platform 1 at 1.53. From where Rick parked at CPS walking to the Monon High Bridge, Rick would need approximately a 2-minute lead on Witness 4 to not have been seen walking ahead of her on the trail as she approached Monon High Bridge. Therefore, Rick had to have exited his car by 1.36, which is 1.53 minus the 2-minute lead minus the 15-minute walk from CPS to Monon High Bridge. Witness 4 passed Abby and Libby approximately two and a half minutes or halfway from Monon High Bridge. So, there was about five to six minutes that Rick was alone on or near the bridge from the time Witness 4 left until Abby and Libby arrived. So, did Rick see Witness 4? He told police he only saw three girls near Freedom Bridge. 1.55 would be the approximate time that Abby and Libby passed Witness 4 at the halfway point between the Mears intersection and the bridge. If Witness 4 got to Monon High Bridge at 1.53, took a quick look and saw Rick and turned back, 2 minutes and 30 seconds later is approximately 1.55. At approximately 1.57 is when Abby and Libby reached the bridge. After walking on the bridge for approximately 2-3 to three minutes, Libby took a photo of the bridge facing the south end, which is the down the hill area. There is no one at the south end of the bridge in the photo, or is Rick in the photo. I'll get to that later. I estimate that at approximately 2.03, Abby and Libby reached Platform 6. It takes anywhere from 4 to 9 minutes to cross the entire bridge. The bridge guy, Go Down the Hill Spot, is speculated to be at Platform 6 near the end of the bridge. But Libby and Abby took photos and likely walked slowly. When they got to Platform 6, Libby may have sat down to do stuff on her phone, like Snapchat, while maybe Abby walked in circles as they talked. Approximately 2.04, assuming Rick was at the south end, Rick passed Abby and Libby, headed to the start of the bridge. It's a 15-second walk from the south end of the bridge to Platform 6. It would have taken four and a half minutes to get from Platform 6 to the north gate, then four minutes to be back at his position at 2.13 at the start of Libby's video. It's also possible that he hung around the beginning or the middle of the bridge before starting to walk toward Abby and Libby. At 2.06, it's verified that Libby started to post both of her photos to Snapchat. It takes about a minute for them to process and upload. 2.07, it's verified that Libby's photos appeared on Snapchat. In the next section, I'm going to describe different scenarios. And in scenario one and two, around 207, Abby and Libby maybe noticed Rick approach the bridge if they had passed him on the trail or near the bridge and then he temporarily hid behind the gate and then reappeared. At approximately 210, male witness five saw a purple PT cruiser car or small SUV at the CPS lot that was parked on the south side of the building to conceal the license plate. Indiana does not require a front license plate. At approximately between 2.10 and 2.12, Rick walked toward Abby and Libby to raise enough suspicion that Libby thought she should start recording him. It's verified that at 2.13, Libby started recording her 43-second video, and then Rick reached them at Platform 6. It's verified that from 2.13 to later on that afternoon, a male subject matching Richard Allen's description was not seen on the trail after 2.30 p.m. 
Some people might be wondering, what about arguing couple guy who supposedly saw a bridge guy at 3 o'clock to 3.10? It appears as though that rumor that he saw a bridge guy turned out that he saw a flannel shirt guy who does not match clothes, height, etc. of Rick and bridge guy. At 2.14, it's verified that witness Forrest's car was captured on Hoosier Harvestor camera leaving, and she saw Rick's car at CPS and said it was parked in an odd way. So does this timing add up? If Witness 4 only walked from the Mears lot to Monon High Bridge and back, she would have gotten to her car around 157, but her car was captured at 214, so that is 17 minutes of missing time. I think after she left Monon High Bridge, she walked to Freedom Bridge and back to Mears, since 153 at Monon High Bridge plus 5 minutes to Mears intersection equals 158, plus 7 minutes to Freedom Bridge equals 205, plus 7 minutes back to Mears intersection equals 212, plus one minute to her car equals 213, 20 seconds more to Hoosier Harvest Store equals 214 camera capture. I know this stuff is really confusing, but I'm just trying to make sense of it. 228 is verified because male witness six was captured on Hoosier Harvest Store camera. He saw a car parked at CPS and said it was a smaller, dark colored car, possibly a smart car. I wonder if he thought it was a smart or small car because Rick backed in and part of his car may have been hidden by a bush. At approximately 2.45, female witness 8 arrived and walked across Monon High Bridge. At approximately 3 o'clock, witness 8 took two photos while on Monon High Bridge. She later uploaded it around 3.49. This woman said online that she called police as soon as she heard the news about the girls, but it took two weeks for a detective to interview her. She saw her female friend on the trails and they encountered a male-female couple, which was arguing couple which she also knew. Around 3 o'clock was the approximate time that arguing couple arrived. Several years ago, the male part of that couple told Bitter Beat Poet, who was a Reddit user who died, that he saw a bridge guy returning from the bridge possibly at 310, but bridge guy had no mud or blood on his clothes and wore a short billed hat and a scarf over his lower face. There is a private message from Facebook of arguing couple guy where he said he later realized that that man he saw was flannel shirt guy, not bridge guy. This would be the reason that arguing couple guy is not listed in the PCA because the man he saw did not match the descriptions from the four female witnesses. Arguing couple guy's description could have added to the PCA reference to no one seeing a male matching Rick's description after 2.13. At 3.11 it's verified that Libby's dad called her to say he was a few minutes away and for Abby and Libby to head to the mirror's lot for him to pick them up but Libby did not answer. So were Abby and Libby alive and Rick had them do sexual things with each other? And when Libby's dad called, did Rick ask Libby who it was and he killed them in a panic that her dad was about to be there? I don't know that this adds up. If Rick was on County Road 300 at 357, that is one hour and 44 minutes after he encountered the girls. It may have taken 10 to 20 minutes to walk to 300 from the crime scene. What would Rick have been doing with dead bodies for approximately 90 minutes if he had killed them almost immediately after crossing the creek? Obviously, we've heard that there was staging and moving, but I don't know that it would have taken 90 minutes. At 3.13, it's verified that Libby's dad parked at Mears lot and called her phone a second time. He also called at 3.24, 3.32, and 3.57. He started to walk on the trails to look for the girls. At approximately 3.20, Flannel Shirt Guy told Libby's dad he only saw an arguing couple by Mon on High Bridge. At approximately 3.30, there's a rumor that the son of a homeowner on the private drive arrived home. So did this car coming by cause Rick to leave the crime scene and start walking through the woods toward the cemetery and Route 300? At 3.32, it's verified Libby's dad returned to his car and called his mother, Libby's grandmother, and also called Libby's aunt. Then he walked in the direction of Freedom Bridge and encountered Flannel Shirt Guy again. At 3.57, it's verified that female witness Seven's car was captured driving east on the Hoosier Harvestor camera. She saw a man walking west toward CPS all of this text here in this column, I already went over in the witness section. So if that was Rick and he did not leave at 3.30, he would have gotten to his car at CPS at approximately 4.10. What happened next is unknown. If Rick's wife worked until about 5 o'clock, he would need to get home before her and take a shower and dispose of or wash his clothes, which he said he still had in 2022. From approximately 4.25 to 4.30, Libby's other family members, her grandfather, her aunt, and her uncle, arrived to help look for the girls. And at approximately 5.30, the family notified the police that the girls were missing. In this section, I want to review where was Rick when Libby took her two photos. In case someone is going to say, 
Well, in the five minutes between Witness 4 leaving the bridge and Abby and Libby arriving, maybe Rick had to go to the bathroom, so he went into the woods. Please, he's not a bear. He had just arrived 30 minutes earlier, and his house is a few minutes away. Plus, there were no leaves on the trees to block people from viewing him, and no one saw him in the woods. So I do not believe that Rick left the area near the bridge to go to an area he would not have seen Abby and Libby, so Rick is lying. I think I have a new nickname for somebody. Rick Okio is lying like Keg Okio. Rick is like Pinocchio, but every time Rick lies, his CVS pharmacy receipt grows longer. So where was Rick when Libby took her photos? Rick had to have stepped off the bridge soon after Witness 4 did because he was not in Libby's photo of the north end of the bridge. Or he went all the way to the south end of the bridge. Rick said he sat on a bench after he got off the bridge, but the benches are only from Mears to Freedom Bridge. So if Witness 4 saw Rick on the bridge, and then she saw Abby and Libby two minutes later on the only trail, it's impossible for Rick to have been on a bench past the Mears intersection. Therefore, impossible for Rick to have not seen Abby and Libby, so he's lying. Yes, I know there is a lower trail, but it does not make sense that Rick would have walked in the woods off the bridge to take the lower trail and did not see Abby and Libby, and then sat on a bench and saw no one else walking by until 3.30. It does not add up to the facts. So I came up with a few different scenarios, and the first three are for the photo of Abby. Scenario number one is, did Rick see Witness 4 and started following her, possibly with bad intentions? Then he passed Abby and Libby and kept following Witness 4 for a while, but eventually turned back to Monon High Bridge. So Rick was not in the Abby photo background because he was still walking back from the trail? Based on this timing, there was no way Rick did not see Abby and Libby. So again, why is he lying? Scenario two, did Rick see Witness 4 and started following her? Then he passed Abby and Libby, and he decided to turn around soon after and follow them. But he stood behind the gate and watched them walk and take photos before he walked onto the bridge. Scenario 3. Was Rick still on Platform 1 when Abby and Libby arrived and they walked by him? Then he exited the trail and was hiding behind the gate deciding if he was going to approach them while looking to see if other people were coming on the trail. The fourth scenario is the photo of the south end of the bridge that Libby took. After Witness 4 left Monon High Bridge around 1.53, did Rick continue walking to the south end of the bridge and arrive there around 1.58? It looks like he could be in this photo at the very end of the bridge and trail. For my first Delphi Murders My Research video, I zoomed in on both of Libby's bridge photos and did not see anything that resembled other people in the background. I know that some people thought in the Abbey photo that a tree or the posts at the gate could have been bridge guy, but those were proven false. However, the other day, I zoomed in on Libby's bridge photo again, and it looks like there could be a person standing at the very end of the bridge and the trail at the south side. I used a photo program, and I was able to find an image of the bridge and then paste Libby's photo on top of it. Unfortunately, I could not line it up perfectly, but it seems like there is a figure in Libby's photo that does not appear in other people's images and videos. What do you think of this zoomed-in photo? Is that Rick? Is he sitting? It's too blurry to say for sure, but it does not match other objects at the end of the bridge in other people's photos and videos. There is a tree at the end of the trail that has branches that may obscure the right side of the track, but I don't think the branches are affecting this photo. The right side of the track does have these black marks, which are the shadow of the sun, but Rick is five foot seven, and he could have been sitting down. Is that why Libby took the photo to show that the man was in the distance? And maybe she zoomed in on her phone after she took it to get a better look? I think this photo has a Snapchat filter, and I wonder if her phone has the original photo that may reveal more detail. The bridge did seem pretty dangerous, and I understand that people like Witness 4 would not want to go out on the bridge if they're just there to exercise and walk the trail. So I imagine most people who go out on the bridge would not just stop at Platform 1. They would continue going to the end of the bridge. So what I'm leaning towards is that Rick did continue going to the south end of the bridge and he is captured in Libby's photo. And the reason he only told police he went to Platform 1 is because he knows he kept going down to the south end of the bridge and on his way back, he passed Abby and Libby, which goes against his lie that he did not see Abby and Libby. Was Rick at the south end looking for a place to kidnap or assault any females? And that is why he later said, go down the hill because he had just determined the best place to take somebody. Against this, Rick would not have known that Abby and Libby 
were even on the trail until they appeared at the gate, unless there was some sort of catfishing or some kind of communication, and he knew they might show up that afternoon. Did Abby and Libby see Rick as they approached the south end of the bridge, and they stopped at platform six, so it would not be awkward to be at the end of the bridge with a stranger? Then Rick started walking north and past them. Did the girls notice an outline of a gun in Rick's jacket when they were close at the platform six, if and when he first passed? As Rick later approached on video, one girl mentioned gun. The fact that Libby started recording a video indicates they may have previously passed Rick and got a bad vibe. Rick did not say hi to the three girls at the other side of the trail, so did Abby and Libby say hi and he did not reply to them either? Or did they have more of a conversation that angered Rick and he walked away? Then a few minutes later, the same oddly dressed guy with a hood, face covering, bulging jacket who looked like he was headed toward the bridge exit is now headed in their direction when he knows they are the only two people at the end of the bridge. Libby got scared and pressed record. But in that scenario, what would cause Rick to walk past them, but later make a decision to turn around? How far did Rick walk north before he came back to them? How long after he turned around did Libby start her video? Against scenario four, if Rick was there to do something to the girls or Libby due to catfishing, he easily could have done it when he approached them at platform six from the south end. However, maybe he had an internal debate as to whether he was going to proceed with committing a crime, or he wanted to check the north gate to make sure no one was approaching, although someone could walk to Monon High Bridge from the trail viewpoint quicker than Rick could walk from the start of the bridge back to Platform 6 and then get them down the hill without someone approaching from the trail not seeing them. I know that sounds so confusing, sorry. After I came up with those four scenarios, I thought of a fifth one. Did the girls arrive at the bridge and wanted to cross, but did not want to go out when Rick was standing on Platform 1, so he angrily got off the bridge feeling like these young girls kind of silently encouraged him to stop looking at the fish. This point here on the bridge is where Libby took this photo. So is Rick all the way down here at the other end? I created a few photos to try and make this easier to grasp. So at 1.49, Abby and Libby were dropped off. Witness 4 was probably walking to Monon High Bridge around this area, and Rick was either approaching or on the bridge. At around 1.53, Witness 4 would have gotten to the bridge and seen Rick on platform one. At this time, Abby and Libby were probably around this area here. About two minutes later at 1.55, witness four said she passed Abby and Libby around the halfway point. So in scenarios one and two, did Rick get off the bridge and follow witness four? So in this scenario, he had to have seen Abby and Libby. Scenario three is the same time where Rick stayed on or near the bridge. Scenario four is also 1.55, but Rick started walking to the south end of the bridge, if he was captured in Libby's photo of the south end of the bridge a few minutes later. At 1.56 in scenarios one and two, Rick would have passed Abby and Libby and been following witness four. At 1.57 in scenario three, witness four is down by the mirror's intersection and Abby and Libby reach the bridge and Rick is on platform one. At 1.57 in scenario four, Abby and Libby reach the bridge and Rick is down at the south end. As you can see, I do a lot of what if thinking, and sometimes I'll think of a scenario, but then a counterpoint to it. So I'm not saying any of these are right, I'm just sharing my various thoughts. Did Rick have a gun in his right jacket pocket, and the girls noticed the outline of the gun when he walked by them on platform six, and then later one of them said the word gun during the video when he approached? If anybody is thinking, what if Rick followed witness four, and the man at the south end of the bridge in Libby's photo was the murderer who is not Rick? That could not be correct because if Rick followed witness four, she said she passed Abby and Libby. So Rick would have passed Abby and Libby, but he said he never saw them or witness four. I would be curious to know if witness four turned around after she passed Abby and Libby and saw if Rick had walked back on the trail. In this section, I'm gonna talk about the CPS lot. I also wanna talk about how Rick got to the trails because it seems like he took the longest route. Route, 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 tomato, tomato. He took the longest way from his home unless he was not coming directly from his home. If so, where was he coming from? Google Maps from Rick's home suggests he should have gone through the town of Delphi, made a right, and then come up here to CPS, which would have taken six minutes. A second recommendation from Google Maps is seven minutes where Rick would have gone south and then taken Hoosier Heartland Highway and then parked to CPS. But Rick was captured on this camera going from east to west. So it seems to me like he probably took this route if he was coming from his home, which takes 10 minutes, 
compared to six to seven for the two other routes. If he had gone to the trails with bad intentions, was he going to park at the cemetery, but there was maybe a car there? Or did he want to see if anybody was parked at the cemetery or at Mears? Or was there a car parked at Mears and he did not want to be seen getting out? This photo was taken after the murders, which is why they have the red fences up. But before that, the Mears lot could fit several cars. So if Rick only went to the trails to look at the fish from the bridge, why not park at the closest lot to the bridge? In Rick's police interview, he said he saw cars at the Mears lot and the High Bridge trailhead, but the interview did not specify if that was when he was driving to CPS or walking past Mears intersection on the way to the bridge. He said he only saw three girls, but witness four said she parked at the Mears lot soon after Rick would have walked past, but there were no cars in the lot when she parked. I think Rick lied to insinuate that another man was the killer who parked at Mears. However, it is possible when Rick drove past Mears on the way to CPS that there was one or more cars that left between 127 when he drove by and 146 when Witness 4 arrived. If you saw my first video on the Delphi case, you know that because the police said they were looking for a car parked at CPS between noon and 5 that I spent a lot of time trying to get a satellite image and I did from 1258, but now we know Rick didn't arrive until about 1.30, so Rick's car is not in this image. And it's blurry, so we couldn't even tell if it was. So was Rick's car at home in the 1258 satellite image? It does not look like there's a black car in his driveway here. This is so blurry, we can't really make anything out. So if Rick was not coming from home, where was he coming from? Was he stuffing his jacket somewhere else? Did he buy any items that day that were left at the crime scene? Have police looked at his credit card charges from that day and before the murders to see which stores he went to that may have sold items found at the scene? There were at least three people who said they drove past CPS when Rick's car was there, but they described a purple PT Cruiser or small SUV. This is a purple PT Cruiser. Or a dark colored, possibly smart car, which is this small thing over here. Rick drove a black 2016 Ford Focus which I turned around and backed into the space, which is where I think he backed into. The image on the top left is his car on October 13th that a neighbor took as they were towing his car. And you can see it has an odd shape, but it's kind of blurry. It might be an ST hatchback that has this odd kind of shape, which I pasted that model up here on the top right. I don't think the witness variations are that important since they only saw one car and Rick admitted it was his during that time. His car does have an odd shape, like a PT Cruiser or a smart car would be considered odd. And even though smart cars are short, there may have been some kind of bush here hiding the rear part of it where somebody thought they only saw half a car. There is drone footage from the morning after the murders and the CPS lot has tire marks, but I'm not sure they provide any clues as to how Rick pulled in or out. I don't know if this was some kind of ATV or something that was later used to look for the girls, but I think Rick backed in in this section here. In 2021, a caller was interviewed by Gray Hughes on his channel, and this man said he saw an older model car parked two to three feet off the road on the south side of 300 near CPS at 8.45 a.m., and it was still there at 2.07 p.m., but it did not get captured traveling on the Hoosier Harvest Store camera. So he said it was around this area in the bend on the side of the road, but the satellite image is too blurry, so you can't really see if there's anything there. But this same witness said he never saw Rick's car backed in at 207. Yet Rick admitted to parking there until 3.30, so I'm not sure how this man did not notice it at 2.07 p.m. He said he worked at the building across the street, and he documented his time so he knows exactly when in the afternoon he saw it. He added that a few years ago, a law enforcement officer told him that the other car, Rick's car, was backed in so you couldn't see the license plate, which matches up with witnesses revealed in the PCA, but law enforcement told him that they did not know the color of the CPS car, which was Rick's. I can't figure out why this other car would be parked on the side of the road that long and not parked in the lot. Was it an accomplice waiting for Libby since the morning and then Rick came later? The teenagers didn't see any other men at the bridge or on the trail, so I don't know what to think about this second car. I was also thinking about the April 2019 press conference. Why did Doug Carter ask the public to provide information about the driver of a vehicle that was parked at CPS from noon to 5, when Rick admitted to being parked there from 1.30 to 3.30 in 2017. It seems like Rick's interview and admission that he was on the trail, the bridge, and parked at CPS did not get input into whatever system law enforcement used to track tips, whether it was the FBI system or something else. So why didn't Rick remind law enforcement that it was him 
when he saw the 2019 press conference, if he's trying to be so helpful. I previously wondered if the video capture was from this building across from CPS. In this latest map, the CPS building has been destroyed. But all of the video that was captured that day was from the Hoosier Harvest store here, and over here is the Mears lot. So either the building across from CPS did not have a camera pointed in that direction until after the murders, or the quality was not that good. Most people are wondering why it took five and a half years to look into Rick further and arrest him. Police have not revealed anything other than in the PCA. They said investigators reviewing prior tips encountered a tip narrative from an officer who interviewed Rick in 2017. There is speculation that Rick's name and his 2017 interview may not have been widely known by law enforcement officers who were working closely on the case, possibly due to a clerical error or a filing error after the tip was taken. It's possible that police were so overwhelmed with tips at the beginning of this case and there were a bunch of law enforcement officers from different agencies, so they may not have had workspace. So they had other law enforcement helping, like a conservation officer meeting people at a grocery store, which is where Rick was interviewed. It's also possible that his statement that he was parked at the old Farm Bureau prevented a match with quote-unquote CPS building in the police database of tips, but police should have had other procedures in place to keep track of who was on the trails that day and who they had interviewed. Tony Liggett was a Carroll County detective working this case who just got elected sheriff. Did he make a list or a spreadsheet of everyone who was on the trails and interviewed that day? I can't find this interview, but I know that at one point, one of the senior law enforcement people like Kim Riley or Doug Carter said, we've accounted for everyone on the trails that day, except for the man on the bridge. So maybe Rick was on their list, but they did not think he was bridge guy. It doesn't seem like they investigated Rick in detail after that interview. Plus, the April 2019 press conference where they put out that 20-year-old sketch and the December 2021 Keg and Klein Anthony Schatz info leads me to believe that law enforcement was totally clueless about Rick until October 2022. And he said he never heard back from them until October 2022. So why did they look at Rick again? This March 2017 article has a quote saying, I'm here to help any way I can, announced Kathy Shank at the police task force headquarters. She returned from a vacation to run the headquarters reception desk. She worked closely with Tony Liggett for the past five and a half years. Doug Carter thanked her personally at the October 31st press conference, quote, Mrs. Kathy Shank, for your incredible attention to detail. What about my incredible attention to detail, Doug? I hope one day Doug Carter calls me Shankmeister. She was the only non-law enforcement person on the press conference stage who was acknowledged, so she had to be pivotal in making the team aware of Rick's 2017 interview. It seems to match up with the timing of the five-week search of the Wabash River after Kegokio supposedly told police that he and his dad were involved in the murders and threw a weapon and cell phone in the river on their way home, but police didn't find it. So Indiana State Police may have gotten frustrated with the case and gone back to the beginning of tips and if Shankmeister was the receptionist, maybe she reviewed old files from Carroll County. But I don't know how Indiana State Police could not have access to all the evidence that Carroll County had, unless it was some kind of hard copy of Rick's grocery store interview that she found in the files. Rick's defense lawyer's press release on December 1st, 2022, had three paragraphs that insinuated that Rick's arrest has something to do with the election, which seemed odd to me that they included that. They are obviously trying to cause doubt in the minds of potential jurors and the general public. No, I do not think that Rick's arrest timing had anything to do with helping Tony Liggett win the sheriff's election. If anything, I would think that voters would not vote for him since he had not helped arrest a suspect after five and a half years working the case. Also, there are 92 counties in Indiana. So does Indiana State Police really care to wait to look into Rick and arrest him just so it will help Tony Liggett get elected? I don't think so. If the police never opened the tip line, they probably would have solved this a long time ago. They have over 70,000 tips and probably 10 to 20 were only relevant to Rick Allen, maybe even less. So if they had all of those officers on the case and just focused on the people on the trails, Rick would have been arrested in 2017. The only piece of rumored evidence that may have taken a few years was Rick's family cat dying and being buried and then exhumed from their backyard to try and match animal hair found at the murder scene, but I imagine that police could have gotten his family pet hair in February 2017 when the cat was still alive. I'm not going to insert a sound effect of a cat screaming when a 
cop pulls its tail hair out to collect evidence. Police knew the type of bullet that was found next to Libby since February 2017. Rick admitted to being there, so why did they not search if Rick owned a gun that had that type of bullet in the gun registration records? I don't know. This is a mess. I don't know if we will ever know exactly what happened behind the scenes of this case. On December 1st, 2022, the two public defenders who are Rick's defense team put out this three-page press release, which I'm going to review some of it. They said, Rick contacted the police to let them know that he had walked on the trail that day, as he often did. If he is guilty, hopefully that reference will come back to haunt him at the trial that he was there often. I'm going to get more into that later in my questions for Rick section. They continued, without Rick coming forward, the police probably would not have had any way of knowing that he was on the trail that day. Yeah, because Rick wore a scarf over his lower face and a hoodie to hide his head, so none of the locals would recognize him as the guy who works at CVS. Rick volunteered to meet with a conservation officer outside of the local grocery store to offer up details of his trip to the trail. Rick tried to assist with the investigation and told the police that he did recall seeing three younger girls on the trail that day. After Rick shared his information with law enforcement officials, he went back to his job at the local CVS and did not hear from the police for more than five years. The next time Rick heard from the police was in October 2022. Rick owned a Ford Focus in February of 2017. His Ford Focus is not, in any way, similar to the distinctive look of the PT Cruiser or smart car that was described by the witnesses. It seems that the Carroll County Sheriff's Department is trying to bend facts to fit their narrative. Um, it doesn't matter what witnesses describe the car as. The fact is, Rick admitted he parked his Ford Focus at the CPS building between 1.30 and 3.30, which was 45 minutes before the kidnapping and murders, and one hour and 15 minutes after it. So, Rick's public defenders are bending unreliable eyewitness testimony to fit the defense team's narrative. Denied. Finally, Rick's defense team said, Rick did not throw out his clothes, move, or alter his appearance. He didn't alter his appearance? Girl, please. In the past five years, Rick Allen has served more looks than Madonna over her entire career. That was a good one. How does Dr. Todd Grande have over a million subscribers and I only have 13,000? This is quality commentary over here, people. My new YouTube channel is going to be Dr. Tom Grande Cappuccino. And my degree is in making true crime videos that are way too long when I don't even like true crime and my rugs haven't been vacuumed in six months. Bridge guy had one of my giant dust bunnies hidden in his jacket. Oh my God, I'm so mortified. Moving along, Tom, focus, like Rick's Ford. I should probably delete this tangent from the video, but some people only subscribe hoping for a moment like this. The defense also questioned the reliability of bullet markings implicating Rick and his gun. The defense team has been inundated with tips they will verify to help prove Rick's innocence. I can only imagine the ridiculous conspiracy theory someone sitting in their mom's basement in Timbuktu sent about Ron Logan as the bridge guy with the puppy in his jacket to help clear Rick. Do they even have basements in Timbuktu? So the defense has a lot of homework to do, so I don't even know when this trial is going to happen because I don't know if four months will be enough preparation before the March trial date. What is next in Rick's case? Previously, on December 12th, the judge approved private hearings with only the defense team present to discuss the state of Indiana paying for the cost of experts for Rick's defense strategy, presumably to hire an expert to say that the bullet found at the crime scene cannot be matched to Rick's gun. January 13th, the judge will decide if the gag order is lifted or continued and on the request for a change of venue to an area away from Delphi. February 17th, there is a bail hearing to see if Rick can get out of jail while he awaits trial. March 20th, this is when his jury trial is scheduled to start, but it's likely to be postponed. Also on December 22nd, Kagan Klein has his final pretrial hearing conference before his May 10th trial. Over the past five and a half years, there have been about 15 men that people online have been 100% certain were the guy on the bridge. And over time, people have moved on from most of those suspects. But some people just won't give up that they know it was Ron Logan on the bridge who told the girls to go down the hill and then killed them. People say, he's wearing the same exact clothes. He's wearing the same jacket as the bridge guy after the murders. Oops, why did the reporter have to move her microphone and reveal a logo that doesn't match the bridge guy's jacket? His jeans don't match. His boots don't match. 
His jacket doesn't match. His body type does not match. His voice does not match. If Ron Logan was still alive and had a profile on Match.com, everybody would swipe left because he ain't a match. I try to respect everybody's opinions and perspectives, and I don't act like I know all the answers. There's a lot that I've gotten wrong in this case, and I'm fine admitting that. But when it comes to this, y'all, the Ron Logan is bridge guy train pulled into the station a few years ago. Choo-choo, it's time to get off. Do your best impression of Elsa from Frozen and let it go. I did a 28-minute analysis of Ron at the end of my four and a half hour Kagan and Tony Klein deep dive with all of the reasons it does not add up for Ron as the bridge guy. Whether Ron had anything else to do with this kidnapping, assault, or case whatsoever, I don't know. But when it comes to Ron being the guy on the bridge, that's not Ron. For people who still think it was Ron on the bridge, Rick Allen admitted he was on the bridge and he did not see Ron or anyone else near the bridge or on the bridge. Rick should have told police in October 2022, oh, um, the only person I saw on the bridge was Ron Logan. Yeah, that's it, Ron Logan. He said he was looking at horses down in the creek from Platform 7. All right, let's move on from Ron Logan once and for all. It seems like he did do some horrible things to women in his life. His alibi was somewhat suspicious, but he was 77 and he did not want to go back to jail and die in jail because he knew he drove that day violating his probation. Goodbye, Ron. In this section, I'm going to explore, could Rick have been ski mask guy or have had some kind of connection to the clients? Most of the section is boring, I'm not going to lie. And it has a lot of what ifs and speculating about possible scenarios, but it has some important points if people are wondering if Rick could be Ski Mask Guy. If you don't care, skip to the next chapter. For those of you who do not know about the Ski Mask incident, in Kegokio's August 2020 police interview, police said Kagan used Anthony Schatz to chat with a girl who he knew in real life, and she gave her home address to Anthony Schatz looking to hook up after school before her parents came home. This girl, who could have been in 8th grade to high school, lived a few towns away from Delphi and was rumored to be the girl who had a sleepover with Libby and introduced her to Anthony Schatz online. Police found out that Kagan had searched her family member's Facebook profile on Sunday, February 19th. The following day, on Monday afternoon, February 20th, one week after the Delphi murders, the police said this girl got off of her school bus and there was a man in a ski mask looking into her bedroom window, which presumably was on the first floor. Obviously, he wasn't on stilts. There are no further details about what happened next, other than a reference that she filed a police report and told police she gave her address to Anthony Schatz. So then, after that, police tracked that account to Kagan's home, and that is how law enforcement started looking into Kagan Klein related to Delphi in February 2017. This whole section, I'm just showing this one screenshot, I know it's boring, sorry, but I don't have anything else to show. I tried to think of a variety of ways Rick might know Kagan Klein and Ski Mask Girl, but everything I thought of seemed to be reaching too far trying to make it fit. I do not think that Rick could be the guy in the ski mask because I don't think Kagan gave access to log in to his Anthony Schatz profiles to anyone possibly other than Tony at their home. The police did a lot of forensics on all of Kagan's devices and they never mentioned someone accessing them outside of Kagan's home, other than on the afternoon of the murders on Country Club Road near Kagan's grandmother and possibly his cousin's house in Peru, which they said was Kagan accessing that device to watch adult movies. Law enforcement did say another user seemed to be chatting, but they insinuated that it was Tony Klein while they were at home. And it was Kagan who searched the family of Ski Mask Girl, not Rick. So it would really only make sense if Kagan somehow knew Rick and relayed that information to him about Ski Mask Girl wanting to hook up at her house. There is speculation that Rick and Tony Klein may have known each other since they are a few years apart, but they live somewhat near each other at certain times. And there are rumors that Rick worked at the CVS in Peru, which is a seven minute drive from Tony Klein's house. But I don't think a lot of men are going around admitting to people that they are into CSAM. For people who don't know what CSAM is, it's photos and videos of kids being abused. The app Kick is known as a place for pedophiles to prey on girls and then trade files with other men, and it has a location search feature to find people nearby. So did Kagan and Rick connect on Kick? 
If Kagan and Rick met anonymously on Kick using catfish profiles, they then had to get to a point where they admitted they were men trying to catfish these girls. It seems like some men like Kagan only want to collect new CSAM material instead of actually committing abuse in real life and meeting these girls. The only reason I can think that some man would agree to share his catfish profile login name and password would be with a man looking for a real life meeting in exchange for cash or something else. Maybe now that Rick is in the news, some girls will come forward to report predatory behavior by Rick previously. If Kagan and Rick were working together to get CSAM or to meet girls in real life, did Kagan send a real photo of Rick's face to both Libby and Ski Mask Girl, indicating that Rick was the quote, daddy, who was referenced who wanted to hook up with these girls in those Anthony Shots and Emily Ann 45 profile chats? Then, if both Libby and Ski Mask Girl declined, saying they didn't think Rick was hot, was Rick concerned it was sent him to jail, so he had to kill both Libby and Ski Mask Girl? This seems too detailed and far-fetched, and I can't think of another way Rick would know Ski Mask Girl, unless both Libby and Ski Mask Girl were both looking for young boyfriends and Rick was using another catfish profile, independent of Kagan and his Anthony Shots profile. But I doubt Ski Mask Girl gave her address to two guys on the same day. She told police she only gave it to Anthony Shots. Kagan did not have a job. So it can be speculated that maybe he sold info to Rick that the girls would be on the Monon High Trail that day. But Rick lived near the bridge for 11 years, so he would have known that teenagers and women would be there on a day off without really needing Kagan to supply that information. What's confusing to me, other than that really confusing stuff I just talked about for 10 minutes, I don't think Ski Mask Girl had school on Monday, February 20th. So I don't know why police said that it happened that afternoon and a police report was filed. I looked at a historical calendar, and February 20th, 2017, was President's Day, and school was closed in Indiana. How could Ski Mask Girl have gotten off the bus on Monday if there was no school? Was this a lie by police trying to figure out if Tony Klein was the killer? Tony was off of work on Mondays, so were police trying to get Kagan to admit something about Tony? Did police assume, A, Libby told Anthony Shaw the location she would be at, so law enforcement assumed Kagan and Tony went and killed her, and therefore B, Ski Mask Girl told Anthony Shots the location she would be at, so law enforcement assumed that Kagan and Tony would have gone to her house in a ski mask? All of those potential scenarios seems like a lot of what ifs, and it doesn't really add up to me. In my four and a half hour deep dive on the Kleins, I suggested that law enforcement should try and find out either from Apple or Google Maps or Waze or some kind of directions app to see if anybody searched for Ski Mask Girl's address on either February 19th or 20th. Only the Ski Mask guy would have done that. Have police searched Rick Allen's home computer and phone to see if he input her home address? That's it for this section. I'm so glad it's over. I'm sure you are too. Just a warning that this section has 11 PowerPoint slides, so it's kind of long. Rick's lawyers say he is innocent and has nothing to hide. Well, if the judge lifts the gag order, I'd love to interview Rick and ask him these 5,000 questions. This is a long list of questions I would ask Rick in an interview or if I was prosecuting him at a trial. If Rick and his lawyer say he is totally innocent, then there is no reason for him not to take the stand to prove that. Whenever I see a defendant refuse to take the stand, I just assume they are guilty. You're being charged with murder, but you don't want a chance to proclaim your innocence? Yeah, okay. The prosecution needs to absolutely grill Rick on exactly what he was doing, for how long, and exactly where he was during those two hours, because it does not match up to the other people on the trails after two o'clock. If somebody in the comments is going to say that a prosecutor would get interrupted by a defense lawyer for asking some of these questions, I'm not familiar with the court system, so if you are, please explain which questions would be forbidden and why. Also, feel free to write in the comments below any questions you want to ask Rick that I did not mention. So here we go. You were captured on Hoosier Harvest Store's camera driving in the direction of CPS at 1.27 p.m. Where did you come from? What else did you do that entire day, both before and after the murders? At what time and where did you eat lunch? Did you drink any alcohol that day? Did you smoke a cigarette or marijuana? Did you take any drugs, prescription or recreational? What made you decide to go to the trails that day? At what time did you decide to go? Assuming his answer, so, you went to the bridge for exercise and to see the fish in Deer Creek. Did you bring a gun? Was it a Sig Sauer Model P226 40 caliber pistol? Did you bring a knife? 
If yes, why would you bring weapons to exercise or watch fish? How long do most people even look at fish? Most people had a friend who had a goldfish as a child, and you would go over there and you'd look at it, tap on the glass with your fingernail, then dip your finger in the water on top, and then insult the fish by saying you prefer Pepperidge Farm piece of goldfish. And then you walked away after 10 seconds, so I don't know what he's doing, acting like he was there for an hour and a half just looking down at some fish. Please. Why did you reverse your car when you parked at CPS? This is not that suspicious since people do need to back out later, but local drivers refer to it as odd. You went to the trails frequently, and there are two other places to park. Where did you normally park? You went to look at fish from the high bridge, but why would you not park at Mir's lot since that one is closer? Rick said cars were parked there, but Witness 4 said no one else was parked there at 146. What percentage of the time that you parked at CPS did you reverse your car like you did the day of the murders? There is obviously no way to prove whatever his answer would be, so he'd probably say all the time just to make it look consistent. How long did you sit in your car before you exited? Why did you not get out immediately? Did you walk straight from CPS to the bridge at a normal pace without stopping? You said you were looking at a stock ticker most of the time when you were walking, which prevented you from noticing other people on the trails, other than the three teenage girls, correct? Looking down at your phone would make your pace slower than someone on the trails solely for exercise, correct? It can take approximately 15 to 20 minutes walking from CPS to Highbridge at a slower pace, and if you took a few minutes to get out of your car, you likely arrived at Highbridge between 145 and 150, correct? You said that you were on the one mile long trail for two hours, and walked from CPS to the high bridge and were on platform one. After you arrived around 145 to 150, how long were you on the bridge? If Rick answers anything more than 10 minutes, there is no way he did not see Abby and Libby. Even if he says five seconds, there is still no way he did not see Abby and Libby. And he says, I didn't see Abby and Libby. So I just feel like he's lying. How far past platform one did you walk? Was that soon after you arrived at the bridge or after how long? Did you walk to the south end of the bridge? Show Rick Libby's photo zoomed in. Is this you at the south end of Monon High Bridge in this photo? After how much time on the bridge did you step off? Which route did you take after you stepped off the bridge? There is only one trail that leads from the Mears lot to the Monon High Bridge, and the south end of the bridge is the end of the trail. So it makes no sense other than to turn around at the south end of the bridge for people to return to their cars, correct? Abby and Libby were dropped off and their ride was captured on Hoosier Harvest Store's camera at 149, around the time you first stepped onto the high bridge. Abby and Libby then headed on the only trail access to the bridge you were standing on at 149. It takes five to seven minutes to walk from Mears to the high bridge, and a witness confirmed she saw you on platform one, turned around, and she saw Abby and Libby two minutes later walking to the bridge. How can you explain that you did not see Abby and Libby when it is impossible that you did not cross paths on the only trail and bridge you were both on that has no other exit points in that short time frame. Would you say that February 13th was an unseasonably warm day? Describe all of the clothing you wore that day. Was he wearing a shirt and then on top of that another sweatshirt and a hoodie and a jacket plus what's going on with the face covering? Were other people on the trail dressed as heavily as you were? Were other people wearing hoodies? What kind of head covering were you wearing? Why would you also need a head covering if your jacket and or sweatshirt had a hood? At any point that day, did you wear a scarf or any kind of face covering over your mouth? Were other people wearing face coverings? Why would you cover your face? If he says it was cold, say that Abby seemed to be comfortable wearing only a light sweatshirt that was unzipped and open. Other than your clothing, what other items were on your person, aka your body? What was in your jacket? Did your jacket use a zipper, buttons, something other than that, or a combination? Was your jacket fully zipped up or closed on the trail? What was in your jacket pockets? What was in your hoodie pocket? What was in your pant pockets? Now I want to eat a hot pocket. What kind of shoes did you wear? If he said he went for exercise, why didn't you wear your black and white sneakers and exercise pants like you were photographed wearing in November 2016? What were the items you stuffed into your jacket? Why would you stuff items in your jacket if you were only out for exercise? There are five benches on the trail. Which bench did you sit on? For how long? Not one single person walked by. You said you were on the trails from 1.30 to 3.30. What made you decide to leave after two hours on a one-mile trail? Ask this to try and trick him. 
When you left to walk back to your car at CPS, why did you walk on County Road 300 instead of on the Monon High Trail? As a way to try and get him to admit that he was the person walking on the road, muddy and bloody. What was your exit path back to CPS? Did you go straight home after you left CPS? What time did you arrive home? What time did your wife arrive home? What did you do between the time you arrived home and your wife arrived home? Did you do any laundry after you arrived home? Did you wash any blood or mud off of your clothes or shoes? Did you take a shower? Did you dispose of anything? What time did you eat dinner? What did you eat for dinner? Did you or your wife prepare it? I realize that hardly anybody is going to remember what they ate for dinner five and a half years ago, but his answer may reveal some kind of guilt. If he was the killer, obviously this was one of the most memorable days of his life. Did you see any cars parked in the CPS lot when you arrived or departed? Were there any cars parked on the side of the road near CPS when you arrived or departed? Law enforcement had a highly publicized press conference in April 2019 when they released a second sketch and asked for the public's help because they were looking for the driver of the vehicle parked at CPS between noon and 5. As an 11-year resident of Delphi, you heard this press conference, correct? Why didn't you walk over to the police station 0.2 miles from your work to say you were parked at CPS between 1.30 and 3.30? You were the driver of the car that was parked there at that time police were looking for info. Rick might answer that saying that he already told police in 2017 but if he was so concerned about this case, like the defense is portraying him, it wouldn't have been that difficult to tell the police again. He worked at CVS, which is a four-minute walk from the Carroll County Sheriff. Did Tobe Lesenby, Tony Liggett, or any other Delphi or Carroll County Sheriff law enforcement officer come into CVS while you were working there after February 13th, 2017? If you are innocent, wouldn't you have approached law enforcement or talked to them at the checkout register and said, Hey, I was parked there at CPS from 1.30 to 3.30. Did you find any info yet on that other car that was parked there from noon to 1.30 or 3.30 to 5? Your defense team is trying to portray you as a helpful citizen when you came forward in 2017, but you probably could have been a little bit more helpful after that if you were truly interested in helping find the murderer of two 8th grade girls who was still on the loose near your home. One would think you would want him caught since you had a young daughter who resembled one of the victims, correct? Then why weren't you more helpful, Rick? You lived in Delphi for 11 years before the murders. In your defense lawyer's December 1st press release, they stated, quote, Rick contacted the police to let them know that he had walked on the trail that day, as he often did, end quote. How many times per month would you go to that trail by yourself on a weekday before the murders happened? How many times per month did you go to the trail after the murders? If there is a discrepancy in his answer, why did you decrease your frequency? If he said he was afraid for safety, well, you own guns, correct? When you were on the trails that day, did you hear any girls' voices or screaming other than the three girls you passed? When did you first hear Abby and Libby were missing? What did you think? I would be curious to hear how Rick answers this if he makes any kind of mention that he was either scared or that it was eerie, that he was within a mile of two girls being murdered and he did not hear anything. Did you see Flannel Shirt Guy? Flannel Shirt Guy was there and walked the entire trail from Freedom Bridge to Monon High Bridge and back during the time you said you were sitting on a bench, but Flannel Shirt Guy did not see you. Explain to me how that could happen. Just to be clear, it has never been confirmed exactly what Flannel Shirt Guy was doing on the trails, other than Libby's dad saying he ran into him twice. Five other people were on the trail and bridge from 1.30 to 3.30 when you said you were, but no one other than the three girls around 1.30 and one female around 150 at the bridge saw you. How do you explain no one else on the narrow trail seeing you for one hour and 40 minutes on a sunny afternoon? I have a section later with questions for Rick about looking at stock prices on his phone. That's something to look forward to. Is anybody still listening at this point? <laughs> on February 13th, 2017, did you delete anything from your phone? Did you own a burner phone? Are you willing to take a lie detector test while on the stand? I know people are freaking out at that question. And I know people say that lie detectors are not reliable or admissible in court, but I would want to see his reaction and his answer to that question. I'm about to go off on a tangent about Rick and the stock ticker thing. He did not see anybody, although he stated he was watching a stock ticker on his phone as he walked. Yeah, okay, here we go. I would suggest that the prosecution grill him on this excuse slash lie because I don't think it's true and it proves he is hiding something Unlike his defense lawyer saying he has nothing to hide. 
For people who do not know what a stock ticker is, people buy shares in a company and they are bought and sold on the New York Stock Exchange, NASDAQ, or other exchange names. People check to see if the shares they own have increased or decreased in value throughout the day, and you can look to see what price it is at on a website or app in real time. So Rick suggested he was looking at his phone at something like this, and it prevented him from seeing anybody else on the trails. The three juvenile girls did not say Rick was looking at his phone in his hand as he walked, so the prosecution should ask him at what point he pulled out his phone to look at it. This is a photo from January 23rd, 2017 that somebody posted on Facebook. It just gives you an idea of how narrow the trail is on the way to the bridge. So homeboy saying he did not see anybody is such a lie. So I would ask Rick, the walk from Freedom Bridge to Mona High Bridge is about 10 minutes. How many minutes were you looking at the stock ticker? Why would you look at it so long? What were you hoping to learn from looking at the stock ticker? Which stock exchanges were you looking at? He should know the difference between the New York Stock Exchange and NASDAQ if he's looking at a stock ticker. This excuse that he was busy looking at a stock ticker and would not have seen Abby and Libby is so fake and stupid that this CVS employee who drives a Ford Focus is so invested in the stock market that he watched a stock ticker for nearly two hours on his phone and it prevented him from seeing all the other people and magically prevented them from seeing him? The defense team criticized the prosecution, saying that a magic bullet will not be able to prove Rick's guilt. But I'm criticizing the magic stock ticker that Rick thinks is going to prove his innocence. I don't know if police can look at Rick's phone records for both internet activity, in addition to calls and texts around the time of the murders. I wonder if they can check if he really did look at a stock ticker while on the trails, or if it was a lie. I searched the internet to see if anything special happened in the stock market on February 13th, 2017, and there was not anything major. If Rick was out to get exercise and fresh air, don't you want to clear your mind and enjoy nature instead of looking down at a stock price on a phone? You have to look up every once in a while to make sure you don't run into other people. I can't stand people who never look up from their phone on the sidewalk. I'm obviously easily triggered. But also, it's in the winter, and this is a dirt and rock trail that has leaves on it, he's going to hear somebody walking towards his direction. This is just such a lie to me that it really makes me think that he is guilty. I would ask him, which stock did you own on February 13th, 2017? If none, why are you looking so intently at stock prices? If yes, which companies did you own stock in on February 13th, 2017? I tried to find out if Rick did own any stock in 2017, but you can only search a traded company and then see the shareholders list. You can't search by somebody's name. The prosecution should search his phone to see if they can see stock ticker searches or his home internet history to see if he ever looked at stocks. If nothing shows up on his home search records for stock ticker prices, they should ask him, before February 13th, 2017, how many times had you looked up stock searches on your home computer? The prosecution should use his answer to prove that he is lying if it does not match the home computer internet service provider search history. Okay, that's enough about this stock ticker, but it does not add up to me at all that that was what he was doing. It just seems like he's so guilty. As I've done in my previous true crime videos, my whopping three true crime videos, I come up with a list of the reasons for and against the person being a suspect. So now I'm going to review reasons for Rick as the kidnapper. I did not call him the murderer because the prosecution only has to prove that Rick was the only man who could have been on the bridge and told Abby and Libby to go down the hill. So reasons for Rick as the kidnapper. The timing of his statement is a lie that he went from Freedom Bridge to the first platform of Monon High Bridge and then sat on a bench and returned at 3.30 to his car but he never saw Abby and Libby or any of the other people who were on the trail. It's impossible for him to have been on the bridge or trail and not have encountered them. He said he was there until 3.30, but no one else saw him after the woman at the bridge around 1.53. So Rick thinks people are going to believe that he sat on a bench on the trail for 90 minutes, but no one saw him? Yeah, okay, Rick Okio. Why would Rick wear a shirt, sweatshirt, jacket, face covering, and head covering if it was warmer than usual and Abby and Libby didn't even want to bring sweatshirts. A bullet, likely from Rick's gun, was found two feet from Libby. Yes, I understand that there's a debate about how admissible this evidence would be. There is no way for another man with a voice like a 44-year-old who is not tall to randomly also be on or near the bridge 
at the same time while wearing the same clothes as Rick, but no one else saw this other guy, including Rick. It's physically and time-wise impossible that this could be another man on the bridge without Rick having seen him. A man matching what Rick was wearing was seen walking to CPS where Rick parked at 357 and appeared muddy and bloody. I agree that the female driver who saw this man could not prove that it was blood on his pants, but there is an obvious difference between someone wearing regular clothes and someone looking like they had just gotten in a fight with different color marks all over their jeans and jacket. Rick was not seen on the trail going back to his car at CPS, so it makes sense he would take 300 or Hoosier Heartland Highway to avoid being seen. Bridge Guy seems to have facial hair, and Rick often had a goatee, including around the time of the murders. I was looking at Rick's photos on his wife's Facebook and had previously noted that at Thanksgiving time in late November 2016, it looked like Rick was clean-shaven, but then I saw those two photos were dated November 28, 2016, but the video of his wife sneaking up on him in the car was the next day and he has a full goatee. Her Facebook post for November 29, 2016 stated, quote, had a great weekend with the hubby, went Christmas shopping, end quote. November 29th was a Tuesday, so she seems to have posted her previous weekend activity, which is a better representation of Rick's facial hair. Rick told police in 2022 that he only went to Platform 1 and then walked back and sat on a bench. There are no benches from Monon High Bridge to Mears Intersection. There is one at Mears Intersection off the trail and four benches headed to Freedom Bridge. No one saw Rick on a bench between 1.30 and sunset. The three juvenile girls said they saw Rick. Rick said he saw the three juvenile girls. Witness 4 saw Rick on Platform 1. Rick admitted he was on Platform 1. We would need to hear the full audio to know if Abby and Libby referenced seeing Rick on the trail previously, so this is something that could be referenced at the trial. Abby and Libby possibly talked about the guy they had seen on the trails. That guy was now coming toward them with a gun. That guy told them to go down the hill. That guy was Rick. There were only three sightings of a man resembling the man from Libby's video. Rick passing the three teenage girls around 1.30, witness four seeing Rick on Monon High Bridge around 1.53, and a man walking in the direction of Rick's car at CPS at 3.57. There were at least five people on the trails between 2.13 and 3.30 when Rick said he left, but none of them saw Rick, flannel shirt guy, Libby's dad, arguing couple, and the female bridge photographer and her friend. Rick admitted to wearing similar clothes to the man on Libby's video. Rick's wife posted a video a few months prior where he was wearing a blue jacket that may be similar to Bridge Guy's. This next one could be both for and against. What happened to the black Carhartt jacket? Rick told the police that he could have been wearing a blue or black Carhartt jacket. The Bridge Guy's jacket obviously was not black, so why would Rick even say that he could have worn a black Carhartt jacket that day? Even if he is innocent, which I don't believe, I would think he would have remembered exactly which jacket he wore once this became a huge news story in 2017. Rick's wife posted photos around Thanksgiving 2016, and the winter jacket Rick was wearing was black and red and looked nothing like Bridge Guy's jacket or a Carhartt. Carhartt has a white and orange square logo that is not visible on Bridge Guy's jacket. Although I did lighten a frame and there might be a white area, but I'm not going to pretend like it is because the video is way too blurry to make out anything and it might be due to my editing the colors to be lighter. This is just to show the general area where the Carhartt logo is and I don't know if that's it over here. The type of fabric that Bridge Guy was wearing doesn't really match up to anything that Carhartt sells. Carhartt has a lot of jackets with duck canvas fabric, which was mentioned by one witness and seems more rigid than Bridge Guy's jacket, especially with the visibility of the outline of something in the right side of his jacket. Here is the list I came up with, with reasons against Rick as the kidnapper. The bullet evidence can be questioned, but that doesn't even really have anything to do with whether he kidnapped them. If Rick truly was wearing a Carhartt jacket, it doesn't seem to really match what Bridge Guy was wearing. Although a witness did describe it as a windbreaker, and another did say duck canvas. These were the only things I could think of. What reasons would viewers add that are in Rick's favor? If I was on a jury and was presented with the evidence in this video, would I vote guilty or not guilty for Rick being the man on the bridge who told the girls to go down the hill? All right, here comes the longest sentence ever, but I'm trying to prove a point. What kind of 44-year-old married man spends over two hours on a one-mile trail and dangerous bridge on a 43 degree Monday afternoon in February 
the day before Valentine's Day, while his wife of 25 years is at work, and he came prepared to hide his face with items protruding from his jacket and felt like he needed to bring a gun and a knife to protect himself from dangerous fish 63 feet away, after walking for 15 minutes oblivious to any people around him because he was so intensely focused on stock prices on his phone so he could trade in his Ford Focus for a Ferrari, all while getting his daily allowance of vitamin D direct from the sun? The answer to that question is a guilty man. After thinking about this so much the past few weeks, I just can't see any other man magically appearing on the bridge. I think it is obvious that Rick is lying about not seeing Abby and Libby or any of these other people who were there after he saw the three girls. Whether other people are involved, I do not know. But Rick is guilty of telling Abby and Libby to go down the hill, which led to their murders. This took so much time and work putting this together, so hopefully people got something out of it.